Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 2110. excited about uh, the joy series we're in. We're in an Advent series and we're going to covering joy each week as we lead up to Christmas. Two weeks ago we talked about the, uh, the shocking truths about joy. Certainly they're, uh, they're uh, not what we would expect. Last week we talked about how Mary through her humility, her lowly state, found joy through that. And those are both online. There's vineyardchurch.com. If you didn't see it, you could obviously go and uh, listen to those. But today, as I said, we're going to be talking uh, about joy again. And we're going to be looking at Joseph. Joseph, we don't know a lot about, but there are some passages found only in the Gospels. They're in Mark, excuse me, Matthew and Luke chapters 1 and 2. And there we see uh, some of Joseph's life. We can kind of put it together we have to kind of use our imagination a little bit because we're not told a lot about Joseph but we are told uh, some things and we can pull that and and see how that it applies to our life we see that Joseph went through some pretty tough times in those just those two chapters we see that he had some some things that caused him a fair amount of agony a fair amount of pain in his life but he also experienced this corresponding joy that went along with that And so uh, if you were to think to yourself, um, you know, God chooses this man, um, Joseph, to be Jesus, his earthly father. Uh, You know, he chose Mary, right? He sent an an angel, said, I'm going to use this woman. But he also chose Joseph because they were kind of, uh, they were engaged. And so he knew it was a package deal. Uh, Let me ask you, what kind of person do you think God would choose what kind of dad would he choose do you think god chose a good dad or a bad dad what do you think bad, bad? <laughs> yeah. or good i mean well you know i mean if you were to think what what is a good dad right i mean what 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 are the attributes of that oh, well i here's some your list might be like mine mine is loving compassionate merciful character a person of character person of discipline somebody who's kind somebody who teaches others maybe those would be your list of of a good dad we don't really know but here's what i think i think i think god would have chosen a good a good a good dad and here's why one is is that we see that he chose a good mom i mean mary certainly was we you know god can, knows the intentions of the heart and we see a lot about mary and we certainly know that she was a good mother so I, would, I mean, it goes to reason that he would have chose a good father. Another thing we know through these few passages about Joseph is that he heard God and he obeyed. These are this is very powerful. He heard God and he obeyed God. And listen, when you do that, it makes you a good person, it makes you a better, you bring your best game every time. And this is great news, especially for those of you who were raised in a home where you had a a, a broken home, a dysfunctional father, a dysfunctional home. And you're thinking, and then you're going to, you're thinking, hey, how am I going to raise my kids? I have a poor role model. Well, listen, if you put God first in your life, if you listen to God and obey him, you'll be a good dad. You'll be a good husband. You'll be a good employee. I mean, you'll be a good person as you approach life. 
It changes the game because he becomes your role model. And certainly Joseph did that. But also, if you look at Jesus when he went around and he used a metaphor to talk and describe about God in his teachings, in his, in his parables, you know what the number one metaphor he used for God? That he was like a father. Right? He was like a dad. I think that maybe he wouldn't have chosen that if he didn't have a good father himself. And so those are the reasons why I think uh, Joseph was a good dad. Uh, but we do learn some other things about Joseph. We learn that there was this kind of rhythm in his life of both sadness and joy. They kind of, you see several, just one time after another, things that cause sadness in his life. But then there's this corresponding joy that goes with that. We're going to look at that today. In fact, they're in the Catholic tradition. I was raised Catholic. In the Catholic tradition, they have something called the seven joys, or the seven sorrows and seven joys of St. Joseph. And they have these in paintings. Here's an example of one. Here you have G Joseph in the middle holding Jesus. And then all around it are the seven sorrows, or they call them seven sorrows, seven sad things that happened to Joseph and the corresponding joys uh, that went with that. So kind of with that in mind, I want to kind of approach our today's message with, with, with those seven things in mind, okay? Because we go through seasons in life when we have sad things that happen, and then there's, 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 there, there's sometimes seasons of sadness punctuated with joy. We see that in Joseph's life, and it certainly applies to our lives. Let's look at them. Number one is, is the first sadness was a broken heart. You know, he, he, that, that's real painful to have, uh, to, to have a broken heart. Here's how it happened to him. In fact, this is how we learn about Joseph right out of the gate. It says, Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Before, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had a mind to divorce her. So in the Jewish tradition, before you got, uh, a, marriage was kind of made up of a couple different phases. You got betrothed, but it was a legal document. It was Once you were betrothed, you were locked in for life. And then you had kind of a public ceremony, and then it was consummated with the physical act. So there was kind of these, these different elements, but it was, it was all kind of a package deal. So when he discovers that she's pregnant, they're betrothed, it's a, it's a, it's, it, they're pledged for life, he all of a sudden realizes, wow, I've been betrayed, because he knows it wasn't him. And he's devastated. I mean, again, w there's not a whole lot in here, but so you, it's, it's part of what we have to do is just to get to figure out what was going on in Joseph's life. We just have to like walk, you know, put ourselves in his shoes. Picture it. If you were married or you were a pledge to somebody, you were, you had a fiance and uh, you, you're looking forward to it. You're excited about this, this marriage. You're going to spend your life with this person. And they come, guys, picture, she comes to you and says, hey, listen, I'm pregnant. Now, what are the feelings you're going to have? You're going to have, hey, I mean, you're going to be like crushed, right? Devastated. You're going to be, you're going to have anger that comes with that. You're going to, you're going to be all upset. And women, if you've been betrayed or cheated by somebody. Some of you have know the pain of that. I mean, it's, you're going to like, oh, I can't believe it. This is what's going on in Joseph's life. She's, she's coming and telling him, hey, uh, I'm pregnant, but uh, it's, it's, you know, obviously it's not yours, but hey, listen, it's God's. Now, it, do you think she's going to, do you think Joseph's even going to believe that? Well, actually, the Bible says he doesn't, right? You wouldn't, and he doesn't. He goes, I don't believe that. He's upset. And he finds out later that it actually is the Messiah, that God, it is God, but we're not told how long he went on. It might have been on days. It might have even been weeks where he's just in this place of pain and agony, this broken heart, this place of disappointment and pain. So certainly we can relate to Joseph in that place, this intense pain. But it has this corresponding sense of joy that does come. Now, before I go there, as a side note, I want to just say, you know, sometimes there's people that struggle with the Christian faith with doubt, with skepticism. And when I talk to them, often they'll say, well, you know, hey, I, lo I love this whole idea about Jesus. It's just, 
you know, there's just some things of the Christian faith that I just can't get my, my mind around. And I'll say, well, why, give me some examples. Almost always the virgin birth is one of those. Almost always. Oh, what about the virgin birth? I just don't know. And they just, they just you know, it really grinds them. They just can't figure out, you know, it's this, and, and listen, when it comes to our faith, issues of faith, sometimes they're not really like equation to, equations to be solved, like math. Some of them are like mysteries that God does things, like the Trinity is another mystery. You can sit there with a calculator until you're, you know, until the cows come home. You're not going to figure out the Trinity with a calculator. It's kind of a mystery. Okay, how does this all work? And the virgin birth certainly would be, would be there. And here's what you need to know. I mean, is that Joseph also struggled with it. He was there. He's like in the, that was his story. And he's going, I don't get it. No, I'm not. I mean, he's like the ultimate skeptic, right? No, no way. Until God speaks to him. God breaks through into his life. And, uh, and it happens in a dream. This is his first joy, a word from God. It happens through an angel that God sends in a dream. It says, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So there was this sadness. There was a broken dream, a broken heart, feeling like he'd been cheated on, betrayed, and all of a sudden it floods in this joy that God's part of this and he doesn't understand it all but he gets to be part of it and there's this joy that is connected now the second sadness is aligned to uh, when they actually have uh, the baby the night that that Mary gives birth so they're up in Nazareth this is Mary's hometown uh, when when they're close to um, uh, having the baby uh, then there's a decree a census where they all everybody has to go back to their hometown of birth, this would mean the man, Joseph. And so he has to go with Mary and his, and his pregnant wife, you know, 80 miles, 90 miles down to Bethlehem. That's where he's from. And when he arrives, she's like in labor and there's no, there's no room in the guest room. You go, well, no, 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 Andy, you got it wrong. It's the, it's the inn. Well, th that word actually is not in. There's a different word for in in the Bible, and that's like with this good Samaritan and how he was brought to the inn. No, th that, that word actually is guest room, and so there's no room in the guest room. Which room are you talking about? Well, it would have been Joseph's, Joseph's parents. That's where he would have gone. And, you know, he comes. There's a whole bunch of relatives already, his brothers, sisters, all, they're already in the guest room. See, in, in uh, the first century homes in Palestine and Israel, they were often built over caves or maybe a two-story room. And in the top room would be uh, the, where the parents slept, uh, a, a kid's room, which could be, would be the guest room. And then, then below you would often have like the kitchen, which would be the living room. I mean, it's got the dining room. It was all one room. It was just small homes. And then they would have an extra area for like where the, uh, the donkeys would, because donkeys were a form of transportation, particularly for poor, poor people. So uh, they would either be in this extra side area or often in a cave. And in, in Bethlehem, there's lots and lots of caves and lots of homes. Revealed. Here's an example of, of a reconstruction of an actual first century home. And that's the outside. This would have been the two-story home. Could have had a, a been on a cave on, or, or not. And then the, inside the next slide, there's, so the, you can see how small it is. And so there's no room in the guest room. Uh, they, so they had the baby down like in the basement with the animals. And uh, one of the reasons, I mean, the people would have left the room for them. But you see, when a baby's born, all the blood, all the bodily fluids makes it ritually or ceremonially unclean for days. So nobody could have used that room. So it just made, and there's for privacy sake as well, it made sense that they would have been like down you know somewhere else and which would have been in this case with the animals and so the baby's born with the animals and put in a feeding trough where the animals eat this is certainly not what joseph had in mind as the great you know hey this is my you know this is the way this baby should be born and so there's a sadness that comes with that that he could not adequately provide for his family we see here it says, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. 
And so this is obviously below what, what Joseph had in mind. And there's a pain that goes with that. When you're a father, I don't know about all fathers, but for me, uh, outside of serving Christ, my top priorities are to be a good, a good husband, a good father. And when I can't do that, it's, there's, there's, there's pain that goes with that. When we started this church, we, we, did, we didn't have any, any uh, money at all. Very, very difficult. And our son was, 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 was an infant. And so we, I mean, we went and looked at some of the, the places where they had nice brand new, you know, these high-end strollers and the cribs. We couldn't afford any of that. We ended up getting uh, garage sale stuff. And then when my son started, and, and clothes from people that would give us. And when my son started walking, we only had one pair of used shoes that somebody had given us. I mean, I, we wanted what everybody else had, but we couldn't have. We, we, we were in a, in a season of life where we could have that. And, and there's a pain with that when you can't adequately provide for your family. And some of you know what that's like. Maybe not financially, but you know, sometimes our spouses have needs or our kids have emotional needs or they have other spiritual needs. And when you feel like you can't provide for them adequately, how frustrating it is, how, hurt, how, how hard that is. This is the sadness that Joseph was going through. And, and uh, what he couldn't see, though, was God was providing, during that time, there was men, wise men from the east, on their way with gifts. And some of those gifts were financial gifts. That was particularly his need. And it says, then they opened their treasures. These are the wise men bringing these treasures to Jesus, but obviously to the family. They opened their treasures and presented them with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now, I understand there's symbolism with those gifts, but listen, one of those gifts was gold. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. You know, big, you know we don't know how much, but certainly that was helpful for him. He's like, man, eh, a chest of gold, this works out. Turns out he's going to need it for something that's coming up uh, in, in soon for him. But uh, that with his flight to Egypt. But before we get there, the third sadness comes when he takes his son to go be circumcised. And he watches him, his child, in pain. It says, when, the eighth day, when eight days had passed, Jesus' his parents circumcised him. Now, in the Jewish tradition, you waited eight days. Eight days is because uh, there was enough uh, buildup of the vitamin K in your body so that you could coagulate the blood and you wouldn't die from a procedure like that. And today, you know, they don't do that. They, I mean, they still circumcise. Jews circumcise many, many Christian traditions. In our home, we had three boys. We circumcised them. And, and, uh, and, and they can do it that day because they just give a shot of vitamin K. It coagulates the blood. Boom, they're ready to go. But what I didn't realize is when, my, when, when I watched my kid get uh, circumcised, they're in, a lot, they're in a lot of pain. Now, I think today they do a lot more uh, anesthesia, but in the early 90s, they didn't do that. And so I'm like watching all of a sudden, my kid's like in a lot of pain. You know, I mean, he's like arches. You know, I understand there's a lot of medical benefits from male circumcision and certainly part of a Christian tradition, but it still was hard. I'm still feeling so helpless. My little one day old baby, just a few hours old, and he's like in excruciating pain. I'm thinking, oh man, I... It hurts. This is what's going on with Joseph. He's, he's, he's there. He's presenting his baby to be circumcised, and there's a sadness that comes with it. Now, the joy comes right after it. He gets to name the child. The mother didn't name the child. The father named the child, and it says he gave him the name of Jesus. Jesus means God saves, and he's, he, it's a powerful name. The angel told him to name him that because Jesus is going, to, is going to bring salvation to the world. Forgiveness of sins through his, his acts of righteousness and then him dying on the cross. And it's, it's, it's an amazing event. And, through, and here he's watching. There's uh, some blood being shed early on, but 33 years later, it's the blood that's going to be shed that, that is the forgiveness of sins. The fourth sadness is this ominous baby dedication. It's an ominous baby dedication. You see, on the eighth day, a, ba a, baby was, a male baby was circumcised. On the 33rd day, the male baby was, was dedicated at the temple, 66th day for, the, for, for young girls. 
And so they would take them to the temple. They would offer a sacrifice. It was a lamb. If they were poor, it was like two little birds, like two pigeons. And they would bring this, this sacrifice to kind of uh, purify the mother, buy back the child. And so everything's good, right? Here they are. They're, they're dedicating their baby at the temple. And then this guy, this prophet Simeon comes up and he kind of like pours water on the fire. And if it wasn't for him, it would have just been a great day. But Simeon comes up, he starts talking these things, and he's, he says this. And he says, and he's talking to Mary, he says, And sorrow like a sharp sword will break your own heart. Now he's actually talking about this, this, how their baby is going to, to actually have, is going to die early. And, and then he goes on, though, and there's some more to that. But, but that's really not what they wanted to hear. I mean, just think about it. You, let's say you're a parent or a grandparent, you're bringing your child or your grandchild to be dedicated here at Vineyard. We do baby dedications. And you bring them here, you're up kind of gathering around here and before the pastor prays over your baby, one of the church leaders who's been around for a while in the church and they come up, they go, you know, I just sense I got a word for you and for your baby. And you go, oh, really? Well, what is it? Well, I'm sensing your baby is gonna die early of a premature death. You'd go, oh. Uh, who, who invited you, right? <laughs> uh, why are you even here? I mean, you're praying, I hope that doesn't happen, right? And, and, uh, and, and it would have been a great event, but you kind of like ruined it. And this is a little bit like what's going on with Joseph. It's this celebration event, he's excited, and this guy Simeon comes up and kind of just like <laughs> puts this stuff on the table. But with it comes this joy, because he also says this. He goes, hey, listen, that's not the end of the story. He says, this baby, Jesus, he goes, he is a light that will reveal salvation to the nations. Now, he doesn't understand it all. But here he says, he's going he's to bring light and salvation to the Gentiles all over the world. He's going, well, there's something powerful there. There's a joy there that went along. You see on every sadness, there's on the backside, punctuated with this joy. Fifth sadness is the flight to exile. And what happens here is, is King Herod finds out that Jesus is born. He's the king of the Jews, so he's threatened by him. And he's going to kill all of the, the babies that are two years old or younger that are male in Bethlehem. He's going to wipe them out. And an angel forewarns Joseph, wakes him up in the middle of the night, says, Hey, you've got to go now. Go, 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 go. And here's what it says. It says, Get up, the angel says, and flee to Egypt with the baby and his mother. And he wakes up out of a, he's in a deep sleep. All of a sudden he wakes up, Mary, hey, we got to go. I mean, we can't even wait until morning. We're headed out. I mean, they didn't have flashlights. He gathers whatever he's got. He, trout, he leaves in the middle of the night trying to figure out how to get there. He's, he's leaving his family. He's leaving his friends. He's leaving his business contacts, everything. You know, this is his hometown. He's going, he doesn't even know where he's going. He just knows Egypt. He doesn't know the people there. He doesn't know how he's going to make it work. He doesn't know the language. He doesn't know the culture. And between there and where he's at in, in Egypt, he has to go through the Sinai Desert. It's the, the desert. How's he going to even make it? Will he have the water? Will he have the food? Will there be bandits out there? It's, you know, or there's lions or snakes, all kinds of things. I mean, he's, it's a sorrow. It's, it's, it's painful. It's not easy for him. So if you put yourself in his mind, you, in his place, you can see, well, that was tough on that guy. I mean, it was hard. Now, we live in a time today, well, actually, when there's a lot of refugees. They're going through what Joseph went through. I looked it up this morning. RN, the, excuse me, the UN Refugee Agency says, around the world, 70 million people have been forcibly displaced. That's the most since World War II. More than half of those refugees are children. They're fleeing from tyrants. They're fleeing from severe famine and starvation. Sharon and I were in Maine a few months ago. There's a lot of Somalis have gone to Maine as well as other places in Canada. But there, a lot of them are in Maine. And we bumped it. We were at a hotel and there was a housekeeper who was a Somali. Well, Sharon and I ended up taking the service elevator for some reason and she was in there and we started talking and we're talking about the differences and how she didn't know anybody when she came and the weather's quite a bit different in Maine and Somalia, you know. And, 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 and I said, well, did you ever want to go back? She goes, oh, no. I mean, it's, just, there's, it's such severe famine. We were on the brink of death. And I came, I didn't know anybody, didn't know how I was going to work and make it, you know, but, but, you know, I had to. And this is kind of what's going on with Joseph. He doesn't, he doesn't know how it's going to all unfold. He's just, 
he's really running for his life, trying to, uh, trying to get somewhere where he's, he can have safety for his, for his home. Now, the joy that comes with it is when he arrives at Egypt, there is a place. They do accept him. He is, he is given refugee status. And God's provision is there with him. Proverbs 2, 8 says, He guards the paths of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. Who are faithful to him. Now, the sixth sadness is when, he has to, when it's time to leave. So two years expire. He finds out King Herod the Great has died. So he thinks, hey, it's safe. I can go back to my homeland. So he's going to go back. He's going to go back to Bethlehem because that's what you did. I mean, that's the man was the, you went to the man's hometown. He was the one who worked. His business contacts were there. And so he's on his way there. His family, his friends, everything. And he discovers he can't go there. He's not going to be able to go back to his hometown uh, because of there's more danger. Here's what the angel says. He says, but on the way, he was frightened to learn that the new king uh, was Herod's son, Archelaus. Then in another dream, he was warned not to go to Judea. So he went to Galilee instead. So Archelaus is, is this new king, a horrible tyrant also over the Bethlehem area, the southern part of Israel. But the northern part in Galilee, it's safer. So the angel says, you can go there. So he goes to Nazareth and he sets up shop. He sets up a carpentry shop and he raises his family there. And so there, even though there's the sadness, he can't go back home. He can't, he's been longing for that. That's gone. That's a dream that's kind of vanished. But over here now he realizes, hey, I can raise a family. There's some safety there. And, uh, and there's a joy with that. And uh, here it says, they returned home to Nazareth in Galilee. There the child became strong, robust lad, a strong, robust lad. So here he's raising up his, his son. And you know, when Jesus gets older, most of his ministry, two-thirds of his ministry was in the Galilee area. I mean, that's the area he grew up in. That's the area he knew. And Joseph had a hand in that and saying, you know, here's all of the ministry that happened was because of some, some you know, because he listened to the Holy Spirit and he obeyed. The seventh and the last sadness is the loss of, their, of the child. They lose him in Jerusalem. And so here, this is now age 12. Jesus is age 12. This is the last time we encounter Joseph alive. Tradition says he died when Jesus is around 18. We don't, we don't know that. But here he's, he's 12 years old. Jesus is. And they're down there for the Passover. In Jerusalem, it would swell to over 2 million people. Just all of these people would come in. And they would set up, just camp. They would camp out, set, rent everything around. Uh, it was um, a whole week long celebration. Celebration, festivities. Well, at the end of this, they're headed back. So they're going to head back. So they're, they would do this in caravans. They probably saw Jesus around in one of the caravans. Anyways, they get about a day and a half out on their way back. And, and uh, Joseph would have been with the guys hanging out with them and Mary would have hung out with the, with the women and obviously Joseph thought Mary had Jesus or knew where he was and vice versa so they bump into each other a, year, a, a day and a half out and they go hey well where's you know where's Jesus oh uh, I thought you had him uh, no I thought he was with you and so they, they you know this blood curdling scream oh no they've misplaced the son of God okay that's a problem <laughs> right so they they hightail it back. It says, when no one had seen the boy, Mary and Joseph rushed back to Jerusalem and searched for him. I want you to think of the pain that's associated with that. I mean, we know how it, re how it resolves, but here it is. They don't know. Now, have you ever lost or misplaced your kid? You know, like at a beach festival or in the mall? It can be pretty painful. That happened to, that happened to me. When my, my, I had three boys, they were all one year apart. My youngest son, he was three. We were down in, um, uh, as a family down in Orlando, we were at, at a Disney, in Disney World. We were at one of the Disney hotels. First time, only time we've ever stayed at one of them. And, and my son actually was not talking at that time because we were, he, he was in speech therapy, but he, he, wasn't, he wasn't able to talk. And so I'm, Sharon's, it's our last day, Sharon's packing, I'm down in the pool swimming with the kids and playing with them, and my youngest son had done something wrong, I don't remember anything now, so I put him in timeout, you know, a three-year-old on, on the chase lounge, and I'm kind of keeping an eye on him, all of a sudden I look over, he's gone. So I call up Sharon, 
And I say, hey, Sharon, is he with you? And I can't find David. Is he with you? She goes, no. <laughs> you know, like, uh, you are responsible. And I was, you know. I said, well, I don't see him. So I bring the other kids up. We put them, uh, them in the room. We get somebody to watch those kids. We're looking everywhere. We cannot see him. We're scouring around everywhere. No, we can't find our son. And uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes go by. Sharon, now it's, we're getting really worried. We've, we've notified the management. They're searching. The Orlando police have got an APB out for him. I mean, Sharon goes, you know, he was really interested. He kept talking about the canal. There was a canal right next to it. Maybe he's drowned. She goes, you should go look for his body, you know. And, and, and so I start diving in the water in the canal. It's about 10 feet down, so it can't see anything. So, I'm, I mean, I'm just down gasping for breath, trying to search. I come up for air. People are right next to us. You know, the pool is there. They're kind of all watching like, wow, what's in the world that are going, going on? And, and I keep diving. The management comes out and says, sir, you can't do that. That's dangerous. I said, hey, I'm looking for my son's body. Uh, you know, they said, well, we get scuba divers. We'll get them out. And so the scuba divers come out. This is now about an hour's past or an hour and a half. Scuba divers are out looking for, they have two scuba divers out there. Uh, what are you going to do? I mean, we're, I'm walking around. Sharon and I are, have kind of separated. We're going different ways. I have like a, a, a posse by then of these like eight guys that were all looking for, for my son. They don't realize I'm the dad. And then I've got this, this uh, the radio. This is before cell phones. Okay, so I got this radio with me. And, uh, and then over the radio, it's about two hours later, they say, we found your son. I didn't even believe it, you know. And they, then they described him and what he was wearing. And I just started sobbing right there. And then everybody kind of gathered, all these guys. He was your kid. I said, yeah. I, I mean, I was just so heartbroken, so stressed out, so worried, saddened, devastated. I mean, just all, it was terrible. It turns out what he had done is, is he tried to go back to the room. And somebody had left their door open kind of, you know, with that little latch over it. And he just walked in. It looked like the room. And he just laid down and decided to take a nap. He got two hours of some good, peaceful sleep. <laughs> Not so for me. But if you've ever had anything like that where you've lost something you love so dearly, how hard that is. And this is what's going on with Joseph. Now, what would be your reaction when you see, when you reconnect, right? Well, first of all, it's usually anger. That certainly seems to be what's going on right here. He says, look, your father and I have been searching for you sorrowing but then they also have obviously joy he's back and he's in the temple they find him in the temple and there's some awe with that because he's with all of these learned priests and and lawyers and 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 people that are all around and they're asking him questions and he's asking them questions and there's this they're learning from him and they go wow you know so there's this joy that goes along with it so this is the life of joseph joseph's life is filled with heartbreak from a relationship. It's filled with, you know, pain that comes from, from seeing, you know, helplessness, from seeing his son in, 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 in pain. And it's filled with disappointment and from not being able to provide for his family. It's filled with unanswered prayer and confusion when he's at the temple and they're doing the baby dedication he's got fear swirling in his mind and what he's going to do when he's having to run for his life and go to a foreign country and then can't go back to his hometown and then loses his son and the disappointment the, the pain of that I mean there's just a lot of that but all along the way it's punctuated by joy you just see that over and over again and this is the way our lives often work out, where we have sorrow in our lives, we have pain in our lives, but then there's this corresponding joy that's with it. You know, some of the greatest things of joy in my life today are anchored in some of the most painful things of my past. When I was 11, my parents got divorced. And when you're, when you're 11 and your parents get divorced, I mean, that's like, that was like the end of my world. It really was. I mean, I had four old, three older brothers, four of us. We were all one year apart. We were very close, and then I had a younger sister. So when they divorced, my three older brothers left with my dad, and I, I didn't see him anymore. 
hardly ever. And then it was just me and my sister and, and my mom. My world fell apart when that happened. My mom remarried and my stepdad was a mean alcoholic. Very, very mean, aggressive. And then after, um, after uh, I guess about a year, they wanted to move. And so when I was in seventh, seventh grade, middle of seventh and eighth, they moved to, across town. I had to move schools, all the people I knew, all my friends in my neighborhood. And when you're that age, when you're 13, and all of a sudden you have to start over, you don't know. I mean, that's, my world was turned upside down. All the, I'm starting all over again. And the pain of that. When I was 16, I fell in love with a girl. She was 16 also, Rita. And we dated for a while. She ended, I ended up getting her pregnant. And we went to our parents, and my parents and her parents both said, you have to get an abortion. You have to get an abortion. I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know what to do. I felt helpless, and so did she. And so she ended up getting an abortion. And then they moved. Her parents moved her. They went, moved out of, the, out, of the, out of the state. Never saw her again. I was devastated through that process. Like, you know, I, I was in love, and all of a sudden, you know, here I am left empty-handed and an aborted child, and... I ended up getting involved in a lot of illegal drugs. And when I was 17, I overdosed terribly on PCP. Huge, I mean, I should have been dead, for sure. And there was a lot of pain that came from that. That didn't just, it wasn't just a one night thing. I was, it, it really, it, it, I had a lot of uh, post uh, problems with that. And then when I was 18, the day I turned 18, I was told to leave, no financial support, never to return. So those are, and that's just from eight, 17 to 18. I, I mean, 11 to 18. Just, and that's, but I'm not alone in that. You guys have, I've heard a lot of your stories. You guys have stories of sorrow. But listen, it's because of those things that I have some of the joys I have today. Yeah. If I hadn't gone through some of that painful stuff with the divorce and and, uh, and, and my brother's leaving. And that was part of when I came to Christ. I thought, well, I don't want to do that to my kids. And when I heard about Christ, I thought maybe he can give me hope and power to not have to be like that. It was part of my, my decision. And I'm so glad that even though it ended so painfully with Rita, because I don't have that relationship, I ended up meeting Sharon, my, my wife, who will be married this year 30 years. And Sharon... We had three beautiful kids together. I have a daughter-in-law. And Sharon introduced me to the vineyard, and we started a church together. And, and you're a beneficiary of that, too, from the pain I had when I was younger. You see, I didn't understand it at the time. When you're in the middle of the sorrow and the pain, it's hard to see the joy. But there's always a corresponding joy on the backside. When we go through difficult times, we tend to ask, one of three questions. Usually it's the first one. Sometimes the second one, not so much the third. The first one is, is why me? Why me? Now, we don't get a sense that Joseph asked that question. He just, he just went ahead and moved forward in life. Because you can get stuck there. Why me? Some people that are more mature, spiritually mature, will ask the question, why not me? In other words, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens. Or Why should it happen to so-and-so? They find out something bad happened to them. Why not me? But there's a third question that I encourage you to ask. The third question is, what joy is on the backside of the sorrow? Amen. And you start looking in faith. I want to close with this verse. Faith is the certainty that we hope for is waiting for us. There's something waiting. We can't necessarily see it. Even though we cannot see it up ahead. It's there. And it's up to you. I, I want to encourage you to step in faith. This kind of faith, say, there's joy that I cannot yet see. And I'm going to walk towards that. Let's bow our heads and pray. Oh, Lord, I, I pray for those who are in that season right now of pain. Maybe you're here and you do have anguish. We're talking about joy and there's the Christmas season and that's not where you're at. Maybe you have a broken heart. Somebody who's betrayed you and hurt you. There was promises shared and then it wasn't fulfilled. 
and you're just sitting there in your heap and you're in pain. Maybe you, your pain is because you can't care adequately for those you love. Probably not financially. It could be that certainly, but in most cases what I've seen is, is the pain comes because they have other kinds of needs. Physical needs, spiritual needs, relational needs. And we feel so ill-equipped to reach that, to help them, whether it's our kids, our spouse, our girlfriend, boyfriend, whoever. And then there's just a pain that goes with that. Maybe you have a simian in your life. You've got something you're hoping, you're planning for. It should be a joyous event, and there's kind of a looming presence of somebody you're worried about. Every time they come, it always kind of brings everything down. There's a disconcertment with that. Maybe you're actually in danger. Somebody's out to hurt you, hurt somebody you love. You're not sure, do you flee? You become a refugee, you have to go somewhere else where you don't know the people, you don't know what's ahead. Or maybe somebody you love, like your kids, are lost. Maybe not physically lost, maybe they're lost from you relationally. They're lost spiritually. You long for them. There's an aching in your life. There's a sorrow. Those are all legitimate sorrows, all of them. And I want to say that God can break into your life and implant a little bit of faith, a little bit of of joy that goes along with that, corresponding joy. You might not even be able to see it right now. But certainly you can ask that question of God. Say, God, show me the joy that comes. Start to give me that glimpse. Put that that hope in my heart. And then I want you to whisper this prayer. Say, God, help me to have faith for joy yet to come. Would you say that to the Lord? Say, God, thank you for the ways that you've brought good out of sorrow in my past. Where something positive has come out of tragedy and pain in my life. So today, Lord, I just, would you say, God, I give you my sorrows and my pain, and I wanna trust you with my life. If you've never put your faith in Christ, take that step what Christ did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago. He shed his blood for you. He came for you so that you could have that promise of new life. Just pray right where you're at. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I invite your presence and your power into my life to make me new. Cleanse me. You say, God, cleanse me of unrighteousness. Help me with my faith. Help me with my doubt and my skepticism. And grow me in my faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.